Hi, I'm James from Chaosium. I sat down with Jeff Richard, who is the creative director of Chaosium, and we talked about evil and adversaries in tabletop role-playing games. Sometimes your enemies aren't simple, and there's a lot of moral complexity to a role-playing game session. Jeff talks about some of the different ways that evil and the enemies of player characters can appear in a role-playing game, and specifically how they appear in Chaosium games like Call of Cthulhu and RuneQuest. I'll jump across to the interview in just a moment, but first, please subscribe to our channel and really helps us out. Thanks. There's two questions as I see it. There's the question of evil adversaries or what are our adversaries in a game and, and why is it okay for us to fight them? Uh, and then there's another question, which is almost kind of a world building uh, issue, which is that, the, that in theology is called the theodicy right? The, 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 it's the problem of evil. Why is there evil in our setting? And those are two related but different questions. And the neat thing about Glorantha is we, it lets us deal with both of those. Absolutely. I mean, it's a mythological setting, so it's a great avenue to explore storytelling. Let, let's start with the first one. So in, in a broad sense, TTRPGs in general, rather than specifically Glorantha, why do we need adversaries? What purpose do they serve? Why is it okay for us to fight them? Well, I mean, and, and I'm going to use Glorantha as, as the default here, but but I'll probably dodge to um, Pendragon in Cthulhu as well, because uh, they're kind of on a spectrum. So it, we need adversaries because uh, narrative fiction requires obstacles. There has to be things that we have to confront and overcome for us to have a story. Stories, you know, stories require that. And that the adversary or the obstacle can be the environment. It can be a big mountain. It can be an ice field. But in tabletop role-playing games, those don't tend to be that exciting because you don't interact with them the same way. So traditionally in a tabletop RPG, regardless of genre, your adversary tends to be something that you're able, to, uh, another person or thing that, that you confront and fight in some way or another. Maybe that's with swords, maybe that's with words, maybe that's with, you know, whatever things are around there. We need that narratively. So, you know, but that doesn't get us to the question of whether that adversary is evil. In a lot of cases, the adversary could just be folk that are no different than you are. They're just on the other side of the mirror. You know, uh, you're you're uh, in in a lot of Glorantan games, your adversary is another tribe. It's another group, it's an empire, et cetera. Those people fighting for that other group are 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 just people. They're they're no different um on a moral scheme of things than your player characters. Do you think that stories are generally stronger if you have adversaries that are explicitly evil, or if you have adversaries that are more like in Glorantha, maybe a little gray? I think it's, I, I'm going to be really controversial here. I think that's irrelevant. I think it's what questions you want to play, what, what do you want to play around with? And in Clarantha, we have evil. We have flat out, we have moral and horrible evil, but that's not usually your adversary. You're not fighting the crimson bat, which is an undeniably evil thing, which nonetheless is used by people that consider themselves to be operating in a good purpose, uh, which is some of the complexity. But if I want to, if, you know, if I want to have explore, uh, exploring moral evil and the confrontation against evil is the key thing in my theme. Of course, I want to have that. And, you know, it, it's, it's called a Cthulhu, in Masks of Neolahotep, Neolahotep is evil. There's nothing good or justifiable about what Neil Hotep wants to do. He wants to cause havoc and chaos. He wants, you know, uh, he wants there to be World War II or the destruction of everything or you name it. You know, he's a bad guy. There's, there's, he, he's cosmic horror, cosmic evil. On the other hand, in Pendragon, I'm a lot of the time, I'm just fighting knights or people that just are loyal to someone different than me. They're not evil. 
you know, those Saxons that 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 I have a hate Saxon passion of of 18, they're not evil people. They're just people that have come to my land and I want I want them gone. But that doesn't make them evil. Maybe a better question might be then, what kind of stories or what kind of things does one option or the other allow you to play around with better? Well, playing around with, so one of the things I love in games is I love having games where the the players take an action for entirely understandable to themselves and their community's um, perspective of the world, which causes a reaction from another community for entirely understandable um, uh, reasons. So, for example, there are trolls spotted in our lands. Those trolls are a threat to our cattle. We kill some of the trolls. Now, of course, the logical thing for the trolls to do is there were some human, we, we were hunting in these human lands and a bunch of humans decided to kill some of the members of our, uh, of our group and you have a buildup as things escalate and get out of control. And I love that as a story because, you know, you, you, you end up with these tit for tat exchanges of violence. And then at some point you can twist the story and find a reason why these groups that, you know, that now have many, many sessions of violent, bad interaction, uh, uh, interaction. Now they have to cooperate with each other for one reason or another, which is, you know, in Glorantha, and now there's some sort of intrusion of chaos into the world, and we have to put aside the fact that we're the Hatfields and the McCoys in order to fight this this um, uh, more existential crisis. And then once we've um, pushed away that existential crisis, we do what mortal uh, mortal beings always do: we go back to fighting with each other. To me, I I love that as a story because it's it's very human. So the human aspects that you're talking about here, this is the way that people, you know, are able to cooperate, even if they're not necessarily aligned and that kind of give and take. Those are the parts that you think are the most powerful that come out. There is a, and, and, and I personally have always been a big fan going back to when I was in high school of the Icelandic sagas. I love, I love the Icelandic sagas. I love Njal, particularly Njal saga where you have these tit for tat um, uh, bits where somebody does something that offends the other group, the other group um, then turns back and you have these tit for tat that, that rises and escalates the violence. And eventually you have a, just a gigantic big blow down, uh, blow up that is infinitely worse than any of the provocations. Uh, and I love those stories. Uh, now it, what I also like to do is to throw into that is, and now we have the two communities that hate each other, but they have to cooperate for one reason or another, because that gives chances for role playing. That gives chances for character development. It gives opportunities for us to, 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 to take advantage of the media that is tabletop role playing games. So what story does a, flat objective evil allow you to tell what's the other side of the coin let's use that with um give two examples one is is call of cthulhu the other is if i'm playing room quest and we go into a place like snake pipe hollow you know when you're dealing with a in, in call of cthulhu the cultists are you know they 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 have zero sanity they are carrying out the missions and objectives of of uh, entities that are fundamentally and uh, um, antithetical to continued human existence. They are, it's the alien from aliens. You're, you're able to deal with things that, um, you know, at the, that, that you can't make any real compromise with. Or if you do make a compromise with it, it's usually at the loss of your soul or or your psychology. I mean, one of my favorite examples is, and I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but the climax in the, the Chaosium Classic campaign, Beyond the Mountains of Madness, forces the players to make a terrible decisions. Uh, I I think that's fun to play around with. 
in how do we deal with, um, you know, how do we confront uh, uh, evil that is is existential, um, and how do we defeat that? And that can be a fun story. I don't want that to, in my games. I I rarely find that interesting to be the only story that goes on because you get burnt out of that. You can you can only fight existential threats so many times before they're not existential anymore. You've talked a bit in previous interviews about how archetypes and psychology are at the basis of a lot of role playing and storytelling. In the real world, there's not so many irredeemable, you know, cosmic horror entities that are true and unfamiliar and alien evil. Where does that concept fit in from like a narratological perspective? What archetype is this ultimate evil? Well, I think with all human beings, I mean, this is a little bit of pop psychology, um, but I think for all human beings, we have to confront um, the inevitability of our own non-existence. Uh, we, we have to confront death. And, and death is death is stark and not something you can really make a compromise with. And I think that that, that drives this is... is uh, there is a struggle as a mortal human being to um, to basically fight against non-existence and and assert our own existence and 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 I think that is behind the root of any fight with with you know great horror because because actually as human beings we all end up confronting cosmic horror. I'll pull things back to some tangible advice for game masters and players. When you're jumping into your games, do you have any advice for players or for game masters who want to start looking at the evil or adversaries in their sessions a little bit differently? Yeah, well, okay. So one of the things I, um, you know, I'm a big fan of is that the adversaries in the game need to have their own cognizable motives right they don't do things you, you can have the occasional uncompromising um uh uh no country for old men uh javier bottom uh uh terminator villains you can have those they are fun from time to time but generally you want to have adversaries that have their own motivations and their own reasons um when when you know, in my one of my current RuneQuest games, they're fighting a lot against the Lunar Empire. The the lunar soldiers that they're fighting against will kill them if they get a chance because it's battle, it's war. But they also though those soldiers will also surrender. They will accept surrenders. They're you know they're they very rarely are they um, mustachio twirling um, golden age villains. And and if you want to have any of those, save that for save that for the the evil leaders, um, in a in a scenario. Now it's okay. Like in 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 Glorantha, there are some some creatures that you are doing a a favor to every intelligent species in the area by killing. Now there are brew. There are uh, scorpion men. There are there are things that are just plain. There, I, I, you know, I analogize it to the uh, xenomorph from the aliens uh, films. You know, you you kill them because that you really don't have any other options. But don't use that as your your stock villain, uh, your stock adversary. Have your stock adversary something that maybe you can even generate some sympathy for. I have a very quick follow-up question to this. What about the flip side? What about the idea of making your lead villain sympathetic something or somebody that you can, you know, identify with? And you have, for want of a better word, an army of mooks because players sometimes they just want to thump things. I love, okay, I love the first part of it. I like having um, uh, villains uh, and adversaries that are frankly understandable the, the lunar empire i you know they're not bad guys uh they use they use some really terrifying magic but 
fundamentally, the, the, the lunar way is not evil. And nor is the lunar empire. You know, the, I would rather live in the lunar empire that has a law. It has, um, it 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 has a degree of social order with the ability for us to also make our own decisions. You know, and and uh, 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 take our own spiritual path without you know constant bloodshed, feuds, and and tribal politics. I you know, it wouldn't be a bad place to live. Um, uh, all things considered in, in Glorantha to be in the Lunar Empire. But if I'm playing in Ornolanthe, they are the villain, even if they are understandable. And, and I like getting my players in a position where, you know, from time to time, what the Lunars are talking about makes sense. But we're still going to fight them because, you know, the, to do otherwise would be to disloyal to family, kin, gods, Unless at some point the players decide that they've reached a tipping point and switch sides. But I don't like armies of faceless mooks. Uh, I like it. Where I had an entire session uh, recently in a RuneQuest game where the characters had been had fought off a bunch of trolls and trollkin, and one of the trollkin surrendered to them. And so that's the first bit. Mooks don't surrender. Um, NPCs do. And I like having surrender. Uh, 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 adversaries that surrender because that raises a whole nother set of dilemmas. What do we do with them? You know, I've got a prisoner of war. What do I do with it? What's the honorable thing to do, et cetera? And you, you have all these possibilities for role-playing and story-making and character definement um, with that. But with an army of faceless mooks, even if in game mechanical terms, it is actually Trollkin number one, Trollkin number two, Trollkin number three, and all these Trollkin are mechanically identical. You let them, once the players interact with them, get, uh, you want them to have a personality. You want them to start having uh, the possibility of sympathy because that gives opportunities for role playing. Great answer. I've got one last question for you, and it's a bit of a tricky one. Do you have any advice for the situation that sometimes occurs in role playing where you are in the middle of a session and there is a significant moral disagreement between not necessarily just two characters, but maybe players on what is the good or moral or just thing to do? Sometimes that can get a little bit delicate. What's your yes, advice? Yeah. Uh, well, I, it, it, yes. I mean, one of the things that I think. Now, I think that that's often a good uh, an opportunity for for good role playing is um, and, and let me go back to the case in point with our our Trollkin prisoner. One of the characters played a um, a follower of Humat, who is the god of death and war, but he's also very, very, very honorable. And so sure, uh, she. Um, was, well, this person, this Trollkin has surrendered. It's an intelligent being. We've accepted the surrender. We cannot kill it. We have to, we, we, we have to accept its surrender and protect it as a prisoner. And uh, because that's the honorable thing to do. Another one of the players was playing a character who follows Yamalio, who is a god of light, who hates uh, trolls and trollkins because they're things of darkness that try to destroy the world and this character in particular hates trolls and trollkins and had a hate trolls passion and has even a geese to his god never willingly cooperate with the darkness and this was an opportunity for role playing now uh, my advice to GMs is you want to create a space where the players can role play this out and have their disagreements with it remaining a degree of distance, right? This is one of the neat things you can have in a role playing game is I am not my character. I am, my character is a degree, uh, uh, is, is uh, a, there is a degree of distancing between myself and my character, and, um, and I can be reminded that the things that I do and say is my character are not the things that I would necessarily do or say. And vice, same, similarly with other characters, is take advantage of the fact that there this is an environment 
that has an element of acting involved. You act it out, make sure that, that, that everybody involved is comfortable with having that disagreement. And if they aren't comfortable with this, uh, with this and it ruins the fun for everybody, then try to call a halt to it or have uh, deus ex machina come in to resolve the moral question so that you don't ruin the game. And, and that's, that's a thing that's always important to remember uh, it's probably one of the most important, in my opinion, GM tips that you can ever have is at the end of the day, gaming is supposed to be a fun activity that you and, and a group of other people are doing together. Don't let it become something where, you know, the fun is ruined because you've let things build up in a way that just isn't fun. And if it if if things are starting to become not fun, and and that doesn't mean that yeah oh well you know the characters might die as a result of this or something bad will happen that can be fun, but that the players involved are no longer enjoying themselves, then that's when you wrap thing uh, that's when you 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 things are going off the rails. But as long as you're aware of that. I like those debates going on as long as everybody is having it in a good in the spirit of having fun within the role playing um, opportunity. It's 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 um, I, I I know that's a, a actually the end of the answer there, but something that that is along the lines of this is one of the reasons that I love the. Um, BRP game system, uh, for which is the engine behind RuneQuest and Call of Cthulhu and, and Pendragon and, and, and other related games, is there is a constant threat of danger to the player uh, to the player characters. And because there's a constant sense of danger to the player characters, it's often easier to get cooperation amongst the players than in, in game systems where there isn't really a, an obvious negative um, outcome by the players, you know, the players are jerks to each other. Well, you know, they're still gonna, my character's still gonna survive. Uh, but in, in um, all the BRP systems, if the party falls apart, you're looking very quickly at to total party kill. And I love that. Um, I like suspense. 